What happens when you're trying to not drink, but your brain keeps pestering you to just have one? Most of us put up a fight trying to override intrusive thoughts with willpower and distractions. But even if we're successful, it's exhausting, which is why staying sober feels so hard and drinking feels like a relief. You have to learn how to respond differently to intrusive thoughts if you ever want to enjoy yourself without alcohol. In this episode, I'll teach you how to disconnect the musings of your mind from the intense feelings in your body so that instead of surrendering to your urges, you can process them so they stop coming back. My name is Colleen, and I'm a mindful drinking coach helping high-achieving professional women permanently reduce their alcohol consumption by 80%. Join me each week for evidence-based, holistic strategies to regulate your nervous system, balance your dopamine, and activate the growth mindset that makes you so powerful in other areas of your life so you can stop worrying about losing control and trust yourself again. Get happy, not sober. It's not about the alcohol. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. And I want to welcome all of the new listeners every single week. I am seeing that we are growing in the charts, not just in the United States, but in other countries. And it's just really cool to know that a lot of you are sharing the show, not just on your socials, but with your friends and you're talking about it. And I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for drawing people to this community because I firmly believe in my mission, which is to give women back their power, to show them that they have options and choices and that taking full responsibility for yourself and not waiting on other people to save you or continuing to run through your life at 100 miles an hour while trying to pretend like your needs are no big deal and then wondering why you're self-sabotaging when you do get five minutes to yourself. Like These are not the habits that we wanna be passing to the next generation. And I can see in my own life how I have broken cycles of generational trauma, cycles of people pleasing and perfectionism and self neglect and playing by other people's rules and caring more about what other people think than what I experience. And these are not the habits that I'm going to be passing on to my kids. And even though I raised them most of their lives in the old way, they get to see, witness, and come along with me for this journey. And so I just really appreciate everybody that's coming along and following along and taking back their power in their own life and healing not only their past, but their future and passing on the skills of emotional sobriety to the next generation, because this shit is not sustainable. And I believe that the change that we want to see in the world happens inside of us first. And I know that sounds very cliche, but from my own personal experience, as I change myself, what I see, and then of course, how I act and what I do in the world changes. And when you learn how to exist in your body, in a state of calm, in a state of peace, in a state of happiness, in a state of abundance, and you project that out onto the world, well, it's just a ripple effect, just like anxiety and fear and doom and gloom and nihilism and all of the things that are the crux, the foundation of poor mental health in this country. It, the street runs both ways. And I believe that we can change the world by changing ourselves. So welcome to the show. Today, I want to share with you a step-by-step process for how to deal with intrusive thoughts. And I'll share where this episode was inspired. So I was walking in the woods yesterday, late afternoon with my dog, and it had been a wonderful holiday weekend post Labor Day. And I was intending to get to bed early. I have a big week this week. I was excited about getting back to my projects after taking full three days off of work. It was amazing. And I was walking in the woods and all of a sudden, I remembered that there was half a fifth of Kettle One Botanical Vodka, which used to be my drink of choice every single day. 
I remembered that it was on the counter. Someone left it at my house. I hadn't had any. It's not my drink of choice anymore at all. I remembered it was there. I had a thought, ooh, I should drink that. And then I had this feeling in my body that basically, let's just boil it down to anxiety. I started to feel anxious. And the reason I'm telling you this story is that this happened like at the speed of light, literally, like that is the speed at which thoughts and energy moves through our body. And I caught the anxiety and I caught myself responding to it in the habits that I have now, in which case I slowed my roll and I noticed what happened. But this is the exact obstacle that you have to learn to overcome how to catch intrusive thoughts when they pop into your head and respond directly to them. And so I'm going to go over all of this in the episode, but I just want to share the quick story that inspired this. So I'm walking in the woods and all of a sudden I'm feeling anxious because maybe I'm going to have vodka tonight. And that wasn't in my plan. And that's how you know what an intrusive thought is. It is a thought that feels bothersome in your body and we'll dig deeper but it feels bothersome and it takes you off track. It's not something you want to do. It's not something that serves your best interest because it takes you away from whatever it is that you wanted to be doing. And for me, I wanted to have a low key night. I was finishing up my day with a walk. I was looking forward to reading a book in my bed and having a good night's sleep and getting up early. That's what I wanted to be doing. And all of a sudden I'm thinking about vodka. And in the old days, what I would have done was I would have believed that that thought was true, that I did want to drink vodka. And the anxiety that was coming up in my body is actually my body alerting me to the fact that this thought has come on board. But in the past, I would have thought that the anxiety meant that I was feeling anxious because now I'm thinking about vodka because I shouldn't be thinking about vodka. And oh God, why can't I just control myself? Why is this so hard? Who left the vodka at my house? Why do I not have any willpower? I want to pause and just like pull you out of this scene that I brought you along in my head. And I want you to, um, to imagine seeing me, I'm in the woods on a beautiful, sunny, cool, crisp afternoon with my dog, nothing is happening. Like, if you take nothing away from this episode, understand that intrusive thoughts, all your thoughts, really, they're not real. They're not even real. All of a sudden, my brain had an idea And who knows what I had been thinking about prior to that image, that memory of the vodka sitting on the counter at my house. Who knows? Like maybe I was going through my head thinking about where I put something and my mind is mentally searching, or maybe I was a memory of chatting with somebody who'd been in my home this weekend and realizing, oh, they forgot the vodka, like whatever. It doesn't matter. Our brains move so fast. Like we have 4,000 words flowing through our brains in any given minute, maybe 2,000. It could be 2,000 or 4,000. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's a lot of words. And most of them we don't pay attention to. These are just the automatic stream of consciousness that flows through our brain. And you have to understand that most of the time when you're thinking, you're not actually thinking. You're just listening. You're listening to the stream of consciousness that's flowing through your head. And you have to realize that your thoughts are habits too. 95% of everything you think in any given day is the same thing you thought about yesterday. And yes, new stimuli and things come into your awareness, but your response to them is very, very typical. You respond to certain things and situations in a very predictable way. That's what a habit is. That's your personality itself is just a habit. The way you think and feel about anything is a reflection of the way you've always thought and felt about anything. I've used this example before of when, you know, getting upset that somebody is late. Well, I'm just the type of person that has made a habit of getting upset when, when the clock strikes noon and you said you'd be here at noon and it's now noon and you're not here, 
Like I have a, a, a habit of noticing that, thinking about that, and then worrying about that and making judgments about that. Like that's just a habit. Like when you pull out of all of your knee jerk habitual responses, that is where you find your choices. Your ch- you have a choice for how you think and feel about everything. It just doesn't really feel that way in the beginning because your habits get hardwired into your body. So even though it has been over four years since I was in the habit of drinking vodka every single day, and it's been quite a while since I've been worried about how much I drink. I reintroduced alcohol last winter, so a year and a half ago, where I got to walk through all of the intrusive thoughts that come back because a period of sobriety does not train you to drink in moderation or to think about alcohol in a healthy and relaxed way. Okay, so I've been in these habits for a while, but the old neuro pathways never really die. And I got to be honest, like maybe I was worried yesterday about some, I found out over the weekend when you can't do anything about it, there's a bunch of charges on an account of mine. And so it was coming directly out of my checking versus a credit card. And so I was probably thinking and I was experiencing some anxiety. And I tell you that because the way that I responded when I thought about that vodka was impacted because I must have been in a little bit of an anxiety. And when my body in the past has been anxious and there's been a thought about alcohol, then I go back into that old neuro pathway. And that's how fast it happens. And that's why mindfulness is your best tool. You have to be aware of these processes as they are occurring in your head. So from this vantage point, which I am way overthinking, you know, a less than 60 second situation in the woods yesterday, but I'm, I'm bringing all of this up so that you can see how I responded different and why the intrusive thought popped in in the first place, probably because I was anxious. Then that old anxiety pattern, that emotional state, when you put an image of vodka on that, all of a sudden my brain went, ooh, we should make a drink. Like that's just how this works. Emotions are the glue that hold our habits together. Emotions are our memory. We, Our body uses emotions to remind us what we think and what we say and what we do next so that we don't have to think so much about it. Emotions fuel our habits so that we can focus on whatever it is that we need or want to pay attention to. The prefrontal cortex of the human brain is a bottleneck. You can only focus on one or two things at a time. And so because my brain was focused on what the hell I'm going to do about the missing money out of my account and is my I don't have a credit card that can declare fraud, so am I going to lose the money? Because I was focusing and thinking on that, meanwhile, you know, there's 4,000 words and images floating through my brain, and one of them was a picture of, of the vodka that was left on my counter. All of a sudden, that anxiety tapped in and fired that old neuro pathway. So that's all that happened. And I'm telling you this because this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of change. You don't change your drinking habit so much. I mean, that's a little bit of it. But what has to change is the way you respond to your own thoughts and learning to recognize an intrusive thought for what it is instead of like in the past, had I remembered that I had vodka at home on this anxiety and I was in the habit of drinking. I would have just started planning to drink as soon as I got home. Or I would have started beating myself up because it was a holiday yesterday, a Monday night. I've got to work on Tuesday beating myself up. Why is this so hard? Why can't I just not drink tonight? Why can't I do this? Why do I have to think about alcohol? Like, wouldn't it be nice to not have that thought? And that would have been my old neural pathway, which would have sucked me deeper into the worry because I don't want to drink, but I'm thinking about drinking. And so I've got this push and pull. And ultimately, it's like whatever you're focusing on is where you end up going, like where you pay attention that that grows, that manifests is more. What you resist persists, what you pay attention to and lean into gets bigger. You know, what you pay attention to grows, what you neglect dies. 
And so in the past, I might have been fooled into believing that I did actually want to drink, even though I didn't want to drink. And the truth is like neither thought is really true. Like both can be true at the same time because neither one is true. It's just whatever thought you believe and whichever thought you lean into. And I didn't want to drink. I'm not in the habit of drinking. I'm in the habit of regulating my nervous system and noticing my thoughts. So all of a sudden in the middle of the woods, when I caught boom, image, boom, thought, boom, feeling, I was like, whoa, what's going on? And I just brought myself into the present moment because in the present moment, nothing has gone wrong. Nothing is actually happening. I'm just a woman in the woods having some thoughts in my head and how I respond to those thoughts determines what comes next. Okay. And so because I caught the feeling of anxiety, I literally had a little bit of a cortisol dump, a surge, because my body, which is my friend, which is on my team, was alerting me to the fact that I was daydreaming in the wrong direction. And if I didn't pull my head out of my ass, I might be drunk, you know, in an hour or two. Not that I'm actually worried about it, but in the past, that's exactly what would have happened. And my body was alerting me to the fact that I needed to wake up, snap out of the dream and pay attention. Anxiety is a messenger. All pain in our body is a messenger. And the biggest mistake we make is to think it's giving us the message of the shitty thought. Hi, you suck. Life is hard, fuck your life, fuck everything. You're never gonna be able to do it. You're never gonna be able to change. You should be better than you are. You're weak, you're a loser. Like all the things that our brain tells us when we are not in the habit of of changing the way we think and just letting that bullshit run on autopilot. The mistake that we make that keeps us in fear and that keeps us on the hamster wheels of all these self-sabotaging cycles is that we're avoiding our feelings or pretending that they are not there or we try to distract them because we think they're real, because we think they're true. Why would you need to avoid something that isn't real? Why would you need to distract yourself away from something that isn't real? And the moment you realize that it's all happening in your mind, the problem is in your mind, but the solution is not. The solution is in your body. So the reason why we head up into our head and start trying to think about, why did I just think of vodka? Should I have vodka? Like all the thoughts popping in. The reason we do that is because we don't want to feel the feelings because we fear our own feelings because we think our anxiety is telling us the truth. And that truth is that we want to drink. It's kind of like the Odysseus from Greek mythology. If you've ever heard of Odysseus and the sirens, where Odysseus is on a long journey by sea and there's this place that they have to take the ship through where it's many, many ships have crashed before and it's said that there are beautiful voices that are enticing the ships to steer onto the rocks. And so Odysseus wants to go through this passage, but he wants to also hear the songs. He wants to see if it's true. So he orders his crew to like tie him to the mast and put, put, and then put beeswax in their ears so they can't hear it and make sure that the ship gets through, but he, he wants to experience it. And so he ends up like trying to cut his way, cut himself out of the ropes, and he struggles hard to get out of his restraints and tears his skin. And meanwhile, the crew, which can't hear the sirens, it just looks like there's like grotesque, monstrous shadows. Meanwhile, Odysseus is going crazy in his head because he sees, I don't know if it's beautiful women, beautiful something, and they're singing this lovely song and enticing him. Well, intrusive thoughts are like the sirens. They are calling to you and telling you whatever it is that you want to hear and running you around in your head, making up stories and making up problems and scaring the crap out of you and promising to soothe your anxiety if you just have some vodka, you know, and you, if you're listening to them because you think they're real, then you fall into the trap of the intrusive thought. But let's be very clear, 
when you think about your thoughts. You can have the thought, I want to drink vodka. And you can have the thought, I don't want to drink vodka. Which thought is true? Well, whichever thought you end up acting on is the true one. And so what happened to me in the moment where all of this came in, the reason it caught my attention is because I had an unexpected um, overwhelm quelch of anxiety where it felt so intense. It felt so intense that I wanted to believe the siren of, oh my God, I actually do want to drink the vodka. And what you have to realize in that moment is now I want to switch to another analogy is that the, the, your body's reaction to the thought, which in the past you interpreted to mean the thought is true. Now I'm telling you that your anxiety is actually telling you it's not true. Your anxiety is telling you there's a problem story going on in your head. All pain is a messenger from your body to get your attention, right? So your anxiety is actually telling you pay attention because you're listening to some damn sirens. But it's also a felt sensation in your body that in the moment intoxicates you to believing this is permanent, this is so hard, and yeah, maybe you'll get through this particular moment, but if you have to feel this way the rest of your life, you're not going to be able to do it, so you might as well drink. I mean, that is also a reaction to a thought that is a siren thought right? That intensity of, I can't do this forever. I can't take this. I want you to zoom out once again and look at a woman walking her dog in the woods on a beautiful day. Nothing is permanent. It's like a temporary cloud that went over the sun and made a shadow. And you you don't have to do anything, just stand there. And pretty quickly, the shadow will go away. This is something that Jill Bolt Taylor, she's a neuroscientist who studied her own stroke from the inside out, and she came up with this um, this research that showed that that cortisol dump, that rush, uh, that blush that fills your body where you're like, oh my God, I can't do this forever. That's just a feeling, not a fact. And if you don't respond to it with the story of why is this so hard and oh, maybe I will drink and why does this keep happening? And maybe if I drink tonight, I don't have to worry about it tomorrow or like, blah, blah. like if you don't fuel the anxiety with more thoughts, that cortisol dump that you get, that flush of feeling that comes into your body will be gone in somewhere between six seconds and 90 seconds. And so indeed, when I caught this flush in my body, I stopped and remembered, oh yeah, I have no intention to drink any of that vodka. I didn't drink the first half. I'm not drinking the second half. I don't like the way vodka feels in my body anymore these days for now. Catch me later. I can change my mind. But I just had to remember the truth. And then once I did remember the truth, I was able to see in hindsight, you know, one minute, three minutes later, at how that had physiologically affected my body and how intense and real that had felt and how not real it had been. And so this month inside the next chapter, a few of the women, the next chapter is my group coaching program for women who are ready to get over the um, alcohol use disorder and totally become a different version of themselves, learn the seven core skills of sobriety, move through the behaviors that they struggle with with alcohol inside of a community and get coaching and content. This is what we do. And some of the women in our community decided that they want to do sober or soberish September. And so a few of them, of course, yesterday was the second. So a few of them were one and two days in and were putting into our group chat on Voxer that they were struggling with intrusive thoughts. And my advice to them was I want you to think of every time these thoughts come into your mind, notice how intense it feels. So we measure things by the intensity, the duration, how long it lasts, and then the frequency at which they occur. And I want you to imagine each intrusive thought, like one of those hurdles, think about like a, a track and field, a high school track where they put up the hurdles and you just got to run around the track and jump the hurdles. And I want you to imagine that these intrusive thoughts, like let's say if I told you all you have to do is overcome 100 of them 
or 10 of them. I mean, pick a number because it's not really real anyway. But if all you have to do is overcome 10 intrusive thoughts, do it correctly, handle it right, they won't bother you anymore. And if you think of it like that, like if I had been struggling, which I'm not, but if I had been struggling, you know, moving into sober September or soberish or whatever, and somebody said, okay, that feeling that you had of the picture of the vodka and the thought that you might want to drink and the flush rush of anxiety in your body, you only have to go through that like 10 more times and then you're through it. Like, wouldn't that be so much more um, enlightening, so much more inviting, so much more like, oh, well, I can do that, especially when you zoom out. And that is one of the, the key factors for overcoming that, the pull of instant gratification and overcoming even the pull of an addictive brain chemistry, you know, low dopamine, high cortisol, uh, obsessive intrusive thoughts, like all of that affects your physiology. But even with that, one of the major tools is zooming out seeing yourself not where you are right now in this moment as if this is permanent, it's going to last forever and you're never going to move, but zooming out and seeing your, the bigger picture as well as the longer timeline. And if you knew that the intrusive thoughts when they pop into your head are only going to last six to 90 seconds, like you can hold your breath that long, right? And that each time they come up, each one will get a little less intense. So maybe the first one's a 10 out of 10 and you're just fucking sure you cannot get through this, but you do. And maybe it takes you a little longer than 90 seconds, but all of a sudden you're back. You're like, okay, it's over. Like the flush is gone. You're back to that calm, confident, you know, dedicated to what you were doing. You're back on track. I'm going to bed early. I'm reading my book. I'm drinking some water. And then it's over. And then you look back on that and you can say, okay, well, I could do that 10 more times. Like I've had worse paper cuts. Like when you really look at the fact that A, intrusive thoughts are not real, nothing is actually happening. B, it's just some hair trigger physiological response in your body that if you respond to it correctly, it will uh, go away. And then each time it comes back, because it's not a one and done, it'll be a little less intense, last a little less long, and then it'll start to happen less and less frequency. Like think of them as the hurdles you have to jump over running around the track and just tell yourself, okay, I, I can get through the next 10 or okay, there's going to be a hundred of these over the course of a week. Like let's get this show on the road. Let's do it. One, two, three, you know, so that's all you have to think of. You know, another analogy is like the waves, the intensity of that desire and that longing and that defeated hopelessness that, oh my God, I can't put up with this. Like that's just a wave of energy. And if you don't go up into your head, but instead go down into your body and just feel the experience, this is key. When you are dealing with a thinking problem, you can't think your way through a feeling problem. It's not the words in your head that are the problem, right? You think 4,000 thoughts a minute, they're all going through. It's the way you feel about that thought. That thought gets stuck. It's like there's a magnet or it's Velcro and your body catches it. Your body's listening to everything you're Think your brain thinks, and it's it's keeping its eye on things, and all of a sudden a dangerous thought comes through because in the past it was true, and you're worried that it'll be true in the future, and your body's like, hey, we got to pay attention to this thought, and it stops the show and it pulls it out of the stream of consciousness. Well, it feels true. It's no different than all the other thoughts. It just feels true. You can't think your way out of a feeling problem. And when you move into your body and disconnect from the story in your head and go down into the energy of your body and just allow that, like what does this actually look like or sound like in your head? Because you're always thinking, right? So yeah, you can stop thinking about the vodka. But what I did in that moment is where do I feel this feeling? Okay, the flush ran up my neck. Okay, a pit dropped out of my stomach. Okay, I had a rush of sensation in my chest that's bubbly. It feels a little hot. I think my pulse is quickening. Like, just notice the feeling. And then just as quickly, like you can only do that for, you know, 10, 20 seconds at a time, then come back into your body. 
soothe yourself out of that flush. What do I love to do? I love to put my hand on my heart and say, I am safe. Nothing has gone wrong. And then I describe where I'm at. I'm in the woods in the middle of a beautiful sunny day. Nothing has gone wrong. I am safe. I don't need to think about the vodka right now. I wouldn't think about vodka on anxiety. Like I'll revisit this when I feel calm and safe. What you have to understand is just like clouds passing over the sun, these thoughts disrupt your mood and your thinking is a direct reflection of your mood. And so when you are in a state of of optimism and hopefulness and creativity and productivity, like I was looking forward to my week, everything is good. I'm excited about what I'm doing. I was looking forward to picking out a new book on Audible because I just finished my old one. Like I was I was in this mood where when I feel that way, that's how I act. And when I feel grounded and calm and hopeful and optimistic and satisfied with myself, well, the thoughts that I think are, they sound like that. And had I allowed myself to get pulled into this anxious feeling, well, then that would have been a hard right turn from the thought patterns I was already in. So what you have to do is instead of trying to go up into your brain and think your way, out of this, why you shouldn't have vodka and or why it wouldn't be that big of a deal if you did have vodka or what this would mean or why this is so hard. Again, all of the things, don't think. No words are necessary. Go down into your body and turn your attention into where you feel that energy in your body. Oh yeah, my heart is beating faster. Oh yeah, you know, there. that's a scary story. And then soothe yourself just like you would a scared child. You know, another analogy I love, like when you're dealing with intrusive thoughts is if you have to be your own parent and imagine if your child wakes up in the middle of the night screaming because there's a monster in the room, AKA there's vodka on the counter, but it's a child. So there's a monster in the room and they scream and you run in in the middle of the night and you flip on the light and the child goes, there's a monster in the room. Failing to parent yourself would be you going, oh my God, shit, there's a monster in the room and running out of the house and leaving the child alone, abandoning the child to be eaten by the grotesque monster while you escape. Like that's the equivalent of how we respond to our intrusive thoughts. We believe it's true and we go up into our head because we don't want to go into our body. But once you make friends with the sensations in your body, again, like you've had worse paper cuts. Like that flush rush that I was so needing to avoid, not because of the sensation in my body, but because I thought the sensation meant the thought was true and I didn't want to have that thought. But once you realize if you just disconnect from the story and go down into your body, the anxiety that you have become so fearful and designed your life to avoid is actually not that big of a deal. And in fact, the relief of calming yourself through that anxiety can be its own little source of addiction. Like once I realized I was in that set, that tense, excited, not in a good way sort of state, I was like, oh, and you know, for me, it was really easy because it's an unusual thought and I wasn't even tempted to believe it. But if it hadn't been, if it was early days, if it was my gals in soberish September and it's your day one, like take your shoes off and wiggle your toes in the grass, smell, sniff, like grounding into your body, using all five senses, maybe rubbing your arms, you know, on either side of your arm, like rubbing your arms or placing your hand to your chest, taking in a nice deep breath that goes all the way into your belly, noticing the smells in the air, noticing the sounds and the birds chirping, noticing what you see, blue sky, green grass, uh, bark, flowers, dog, all of the things. Like the more you can bring yourself into the present moment, the more and quicker you can escape the anxiety that is caused by intrusive thoughts because they're not real. What is real is where you are in this moment. And yes, the felt sensation of that anxiety is part of it. But the more you give your t- attention to the anxiety, not the, not the uh, story in your head, 
the you it's hard to even locate it's it's kind of like trying to nail jello to a tree like it's ethereal it's like the closer you get to the clouds as you're taken off into a flight the closer you get the harder it is to see there's no shape there's no form and pretty soon you're just in the clouds and yet there is no cloud you can't see the cloud and that is what it's like to process an emotion that you don't process the emotion by thinking about the emotion that's for like storytelling time later when you tell about how you moved through it. You, the mindset that sees the problem can't fix the problem because it's creating the problem. The mindset that thinks I want to drink alcohol cannot think me through that. I had to go back into re- my body and remember that I am safe and remember what it feels like to be safe. And then that allows me to to remember how to think like I want to think. And again, as I started this episode, this whole thing took place over like 12 seconds yesterday, but I'm slowing it down for you so that you can understand how to identify your own intrusive thoughts. Your own intrusive thoughts are the ones that feel bad in your body, period, the end. Your body is alerting you to the fact that you got some bullshit on board. And instead of responding to your anxiety, like it's telling you the truth, you expand to your body, like it's asking you for help. Your body is saying, my brain is telling me a shitty story and I feel like this is not going to go well. And you're like, oh baby, I got you. And you're like, I'm going to run this hurdle. I can hold my breath. I'm going to soothe myself. I'm going to ground myself. I'm going to calm my body down so that my brain can come back online. Because that's the other thing. When you have a stress response, it your prefrontal cortex goes back off, goes offline. You're no longer thinking rationally. Your amygdala takes over and your emotions are not rational. You can sit and listen to them and you can argue with them. We've all done it. It doesn't work, right? Like it just makes things worse. When you're in a hole, like especially like if you hear the words, I used to say that to myself all the time, I'm in a hole, stop digging, stop thinking. Your thoughts are putting in you into the hole. Look around. You're not in a hole. There is no hole. Look down. You're in your bed. You're in your car. You're in the woods walking your dog. There is no hole. So thinking about the hole that you're in doesn't get you out of the hole. Coming back into the present moment where you remember who you are and how to take care of your body, being the parent that stays with a child, it's not a monster. It's not even real. It was a dream or it's a teddy bear under the bed like whatever, soothing yourself, soothing your body, parenting your body, and allowing your body to tattle on your brain and tell you when your thoughts are daydreaming in the wrong direction because you're having a physiological response to the thought process. Anxiety is your friend. You don't have to be held hostage by it. You just have to slow the fuck down, slow your roll and respond to it. And yes, this takes time in the beginning, what else are you going to do? Run through life chasing monsters that aren't real or running away from monsters that aren't real? This is a habit that you can build. And the sooner you connect with the felt sense of relief because you respond to your anxiety and you respond to your intrusive thoughts in a real way, and it's messy, you guys, I'm making it sound like it's super simple. I'm breaking it down for you. It's not. It's not. Sometimes it's hard to turn off the, what is the alarm in your body? Because sometimes it's not just about the alcohol. Like for me, I'm a little bit, not a little, I'm a lot adept at this. I'm very good at this. And so I knew that that thought didn't even appear because the vodka's on my counter. The thought appeared because there's money missing from my account. It went deeper than that. And then it could go deeper than that. You know, in the past when I've had financial, you know, uh, traumas where I've even been stolen from or lost money I didn't expect, like that's what's happening in my body. And that's not what this episode is about. You will get there to where an image of vodka in your head connects to a wound of financial trauma from, you know, 25 years ago or something. Like I, I can make these connections very, very fast. You will too. This is a skill but you have to start on level one. You have to start by recognizing that your intrusive thoughts are something you can overcome if you don't continue to think them and pour fuel on the fire. And this skill of managing these intrusive thoughts is how you quickly accelerate your recovery of how you quickly move into a completely different orbit. When you are no longer held hostage by your brain, 
you now have access to control the most powerful computing tool on the planet. It's at your disposal. Your brain is a tool. All you have to do is learn how to use it. And until you do, you're the tool. You're the one, you're, you're being thought. <laughs> you're the thunker, right? You can actually learn to think on purpose. You can redirect your thought patterns. You can soothe your anxiety through somatic practices, breath work, calming, you know, sensory integration. Like these are skills. And when you learn how to read your own body language and you are paying attention to what's happening in your body and you believe your body and use your brain for entertainment purposes only, kind of like a glow in the dark condom, not for internal use. Like you can program your brain to think about whatever you want. And whenever that shit goes sideways, you can just think about something different. Your body is the one that you need to listen to. Your body is the one you need to pay attention to. The body cannot lie. And if thoughts don't feel good in your body, I don't care what those thoughts are or how true you think they are. Then that truth needs to be questioned, expanded. What else could be true? What do you want to be true? That's a lot. I get I get all of that. My whole thing is to leave you with... Um, an inspiration for your intrusive thoughts. So here's your takeaway. I want you to start noticing your intrusive thoughts. Maybe take some time right now because you know what they're going to be, right? Depend. It's probably, I mean, pick, pick a topic on alcohol. What is the intrusive thought that pops into your mind? When does it pop into your mind? Where does it pop into to your mind? And get your game on. Like, let's get ready for this you can do this. Identify the thought when you're most at week and make a plan. What are you going to do? Like takeaways from this episode, you know, stop, drop and feel, take a breath, remind yourself that your anxiety is your friend and that the thought is full of sh- is bullshit. Like whatever it is, like make a plan to take this episode and integrate it into your life. And just imagine, pick a number, how many intrusive thoughts do you have to get to to get to the other side of, of the evening without drinking or drinking less, like whatever it is, or it doesn't have to do anything without alcohol? How many intrusive thoughts do you need before you don't spend the money, before you don't eat the brownie, before you don't raise your voice at your kids or at your partner, or go and offer to help somebody that you don't actually have time to help because you're busy with your own self-care? And that person should be really helping themselves anyway. Like there are intrusive thoughts for impulsive behaviors. Every impulsive behavior has an intrusive thought. So pick the impulsive behavior you want to work on, identify the intrusive thoughts, when do they come up, and then make a plan to jump those hurdles, to stuff your ears with beeswax and, and not listen to the sirens like Odysseus. Make a plan. And then this is a muscle. And so instead of shrinking away from your intrusive thoughts. Every time you get one and you jump the hurdle, celebrate, relish the experience, the felt sensation of coming back into a sense of relief because you let that thought go, because you didn't jump on the crazy horse and let it run you out of the barn. Celebrate that. And then notice that you're getting stronger, just like doing bicep curls or push-ups, like Think of your intrusive thoughts as a mental health workout where you are becoming the master of your brain and you are getting stronger and it's getting easier to jump the hurdles and then the hurdles are coming less and less because you're spending more time directing your brain into thoughts that you want to think and that give you joy and created creativity and move you forward instead of getting stuck in your head with all these repetitive thoughts. Like, who would you be? without all the thinking that you do, what else could you be thinking about? You know, this is what I teach in the next chapter. You don't make all those thoughts go away. You don't try to think your way out of a negative thinking pattern. You just stop thinking, redirect, and then ask yourself other questions. What else could be true? What else do I want to focus on? Instead of thinking about the past and worrying about the future, like where do you want to be one year from now? What skills do you need to get there? What resources do you need to collect or find? What tools do you, and skills do you need to learn, right? Where do you want to be one year from now? And the more time you devote to skills like overcoming intrusive thoughts, the less they are holding you back, the less you are weighed down 
because you're exhausting your own mental resources, answering questions that are not even real and worrying about problems that only exist in your mind. Can you imagine what would be possible for you when you free up these mental and emotional resources because you're no longer afraid to feel because it doesn't actually hurt and you're willing to spend the time to feel it. You know, it doesn't it doesn't go away overnight and at first it's really overwhelming because there's so many things to feel. But you, it's, you, you can't afford to not invest the time and the energy to learn how to process emotions and manage your mind. Because as long as you are being controlled by them, you're heading in the wrong direction. You are not the master of your life. The best thing you can do is put your mental health first and put aside any other goal. Again, coming full circle, going back to being the change that you want to have in your life, all the things that you wish for can be yours. The moment you stop waiting to give yourself permission to feel better when you get everything figured out, because there's nothing to figure out. There's just actions to take and skills to learn and beautiful experiences to have as you become your own best friend, no longer needing to escape the feelings in your body because you no longer believe in the story in your head. So, That is what I have for you today with intrusive thoughts. I want to thank you for listening. And I encourage you if I'm a person that makes sense to you, you know, like I can listen to different people. Eckhart Tolle, I can't get through one of his episodes, but Michael Singer, I look up every word he says. I think they're saying the same damn thing, but Michael Singer's just a person whose, whose words make more sense to me. Michael Singer is the the Untethered Soul author, and he also has a podcast, and I like his podcast. And I love Eckhart Tolle, too. I just can't listen to him. No offense to that guy. If I'm the type of person that you can listen to, and you are ready to do the work, if you are realizing that the only thing holding you back is the stories you're telling yourself in your head, and you are ready to take control of your mind and heal past traumas in your body and heal those emotional habits that are keeping you stuck and move into a version of yourself that is no longer afraid of an image of vodka popping into your head and a little squirt of cortisol coming into your body like that no longer sets you back or puts you on the wrong course. If you're ready to do that work, I can teach you. I have a wonderful community of women who have all decided it's go time. And if you want to know more about my program, which is called The Next Chapter, where the goal is to learn the seven seven core skills of emotional sobriety and also a side course of mindful drinking lessons at the same time, if you want to learn more about that, get into the show notes and click the link to schedule a free discovery call with me and come and see me. I don't do high pressure sales calls because my program isn't for everybody. It's not a sobriety program. And that being said, you know, we have sober support for people who are doing 10 day detoxes or a month here or there. Um, But sobriety is, is a form of self care, kind of like sleep, the more the better. But our community is a group of what is becoming more and more tightly knit group of women learning to be honest about where you're at and what your needs are. It's shame-free, non-judgmental, no bullshit allowed uh, in terms of your own bullshit. You know, we don't sit around and tell sad stories. We are reclaiming our power. And that's a skill, my friend. It's not about how strong you are. It's about if you're ready to will- ready and willing to learn. So you can get in the show notes and book that with me and I will do a call with you. We'll go over where you're at and where you want to be, the skills that you're going to need, and then we can talk solutions that apply to you. And if my coaching program is of interest to you, we'll discuss it on the call. Otherwise, please share this show if it meant something to you. Text it to a friend, share it on your socials, talk about it with friends about, you know, a certain episode, or you can leave me a review on Apple or Spotify. Spotify doesn't do reviews, just Apple, but you can do a rating on Spotify. And I appreciate that. Anything and everything you do helps my show grow. As I know you already are, as I started this episode, I'm blown away by my analytics every single week. Thank you very much. And then finally, take some time to integrate what you've learned. Grab a journal 
or type on your phone, whatever it is you do, and make some notes about what you learned, what's your takeaway, and what's your plan. Because we all have impulsive behaviors, and that means you have intrusive thoughts. I want you to make a plan to jump the next hurdle. So don't let this episode go to waste. You need to take some action right now. Stop, drop, and feel, and make a plan. So I appreciate you listening, and I'll talk to you next week.